is that we want to welcome people to our country. We want to smile when they come in and not frown. We want to make it less of a burden and less of a waiting time to become a citizen, to become an economic immigrant, to become a visitor. The whole conservative system is drowning in increased waiting times. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And thanks to all who are joining us for tonight's debate, uh, second reading debate on an important bill. I'm delighted uh, to be able to rise in the House today to speak to Bill C-24, the Strengthening Canadian Citizenship Act. These are, Mr. Speaker, the first comprehensive reforms to our Citizenship Act in more than a generation, since 1977. And their aim is very clear. It is to strengthen and protect the value of Canadian citizenship this was a commitment our government made in its most recent speech from the throne, and it's one that we're keeping with today's debate uh, and by making this a legislative priority of our government. Our government, as everyone knows, has made transformational changes to the immigration system of this country in the past eight years in order that it respond as well as possible to Canada's needs and the needs of the economy and to make sure that it serves the national interest. In doing so, we must also improve the process for awarding Canadian citizens citizenship to qualified applicants. Immigrants look forward to citizenship, and the quality of our citizenship programs depend on the integrity of our citizenship program. We have to make sure that our policies and practices in this matter adequately reflect the great importance of citizenship. Mr. Speaker, that has driven uh, this legislation, driven our thinking in this government, drink, driven the support that we're receiving across the country uh, for these reforms. Canadians take enormous pride in their citizenship uh, and unprecedented pride. Uh, I hear the member for Calgary Northeast uh, endorsing that view that there are Canadians across this country who are passionate about their citizenship as never before and we are passionate as a government about the contribution of the member for Calgary Northeast to this bill. This has been the work of many hands including that of my honorable colleague the member for Vancouver West, Sunshine Coast, Sea to Sky Country and many others uh, who have been absolutely uh, instrumental in weaving together the reforms that we are now presenting and debating. But why is citizenship seen as so important? What indeed is citizenship, Mr. Speaker, in the 21st century? Well, it's an ancient concept. It goes, some trace it back to biblical times, to holy scripture in many different countries. Some refer to the holy covenant that the people of Israel had uh, with their God. Uh, a kind of contract between a whole people uh, and a God that had given law and according to which that people felt obliged to live. Uh, in ancient Greece, the concept of citizenship achieved a new level and a new recognition of the role of individuals in participating in the life of their cities, of their communities, of, their, of the political entities in which they lived because it became clear even then, in the 4th, 5th century, before the Christian era, that true freedom, true human potential in all of its facets could only be realized when people work together on the basis of laws, when no one person was the arbitrary master of others, that slavery was an inferior way of living and that the freedom that underpins citizenship uh, would be one of the primary aspirations of humanity and so it remains today, Mr. Speaker. Citizenship is quite simply the opposite, the opportunity to be at our best, the opportunity to participate in institutions that have been handed down to us 
by generations, over generations. Uh, it's a balance between participation, the responsibilities that go with participation on the one hand, and obligations and rights on the other hand. It's sharing in the civil, civic life of country in the full sense of the word. Not just holding the passport, Mr. Speaker, not just coming every four years on voting day to mark one's ballot, although those are absolutely fundamental aspects of our citizenship. It's participation in the fullest sense, uh, participation in the needs of our neighbors, participation in voluntary organizations, participation in uh, the economy and the economic excellence that a country like Canada has managed to achieve. These are the gains of freedom, Mr. Speaker, that citizenship, to which citizenship has opened the door over centuries, indeed millennia, and which have been achieved on a level in this country that is without parallel, we think, in the history of humanity. Now, what is Canadian citizenship? What is our version of this global, great global legacy that to which so many aspire, but few actually achieve in the full sense, in the highest sense, where freedom is a reality for individuals, including minorities. Well, in Canada, our citizenship has involved First Nations and Inuit. It has involved their languages and culture, their love of the land. It has involved the development of institutions uh, qui remontent uh, à l'époque de Cartier. Let's go back to Jacques Cartier and Samuel de Champlain who had been accompanied by Mathieu de Costa, who is being celebrated during Black History Month every year. It goes back to New France, where people like Frontenac, La Salle, La Vérendrie went to discover a whole continent and forged a vision of a country that is dear to us to this day. Mr. Speaker, as you know, that has striven to make institutions as representative as possible. There was already a Conseil Souverain under the Ancien Regime under the, in, at the time of Nouvelle France. But we know that Canada was one of the first countries to establish assemblies in the two Canadas. In Nova Scotia, a representative assembly had been established as far back as 1758, among the earliest in the British Empire. And through the War of 1812, when those traditions were challenged uh, and our numbers augmented by those who fled that, who, who fled the United States decades earlier during the American Revolution, uh, and in the decades leading up to Confederation, uh, we fought in this country to have not only assemblies, not only honest government, free of corruption, we fought to have accountable, responsible government. Uh, and it was citizens across this country, uh, in cities and towns, in rural areas and urban centers, who paved that pathway to confederation, who underpinned that national policy, and who brought us strong and free into the 20th century, where the story of a larger Canada, uh, and a Canada that eventually adopted uh, a citizenship back in 1947, uh, begins. So it is a tremendously exciting legacy, one that we all have a responsibility uh, to live up to in this day and age, one that we are seeking to renew and reinforce with this bill. And the bill has three highlights. First, it aims to reinforce the value of citizenship by strengthening that value and improving efficiency of processing, as well as deterring citizens of convenience, deterring the idea that the passport is all that it's about. That Canadian citizenship could be, for some, merely a flag of convenience without that full participation in Canadian life uh, that we know are so essential to the success of our country. Secondly, it's about maintaining the integrity of citizenship, combating fraud, which we have to do across our programs as the challenge of fraud becomes more sophisticated uh, throughout modern life, and deter disloyalty. There are those. Uh, Mr. Speaker, who would plant the wrong kinds, disastrous ideologies in, through the internet or through other forms of recruitment in the minds of our young people and literally turn them against Canada. A very limit, limited number in this country were pleased to be able to report 
uh, but we want to deter that kind of behaviour altogether. And finally, as always on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, we want to honour those who serve Canada, and there are several measures in this bill that will do so. Mais tout d'abord. First of all, Mr. Speaker, I want to discuss further strengthening the value of citizenship. As I said, Canadian citizenship is fundamental, inestimable in this world. It's important to have policies that respect and reinforce that strength. I'm not sure all members understand to what extent people seek out Canadian citizenship all across the world. A lot of people admire us, respect us, want to become immigrants and want to become citizens. Among the measures stated in Bill C-24 to attain that objective, let us cite the changes to the 10-year residency criteria. In other words, the period during which people have to actually physically be in Canada will be extended. These changes will promote the integration of uh, new immigrants in by increasing the requirement for residency from three years out of the last four years to four years out of the last six. So that means that we have to be in Canada. Who apply for Canadian citizenship to make that commitment explicitly up front, to be physically present in Canada, not for three out of four years, but for four out of six years, something that we didn't do before. The requirement for effective presence in Canada would favor integration of uh, new immigrants to Canadian society because for someone to understand Canadian social and cultural norms, they truly have to experience it. Nothing can substitute for direct experience of our landscape, of our communities, of our institutions. Right here, Mr. Speaker, before we get too far into this, that the rules will only apply not only after this law comes into force, but after the necessary orders in council have been gazetted, uh, changing the regulations in this respect. So anyone who is making an application to become a Canadian citizen now or for the foreseeable future as this bill moves through this house uh, and the other place uh, will be treated under the current rules. I want to be absolutely explicit under that point. As well, citizenship applicants would no longer be able to use the time they spent in Canada as non-permanent residents to meet the citizenship residence requirements. Again, this reinforces the value of citizenship by requiring applicants to demonstrate a commitment to Canada through permanent residence. We do this for most permanent residents. And so why, not should, we should, why should we not do it for all in a country where equality is such uh, a highly prized principle uh, and a defensible principle in this case? Any, any um, move to part ways with that principle, Mr. Speaker, would risk confusing a situation that in the past has been confused and has led to abuse on a significant scale. Another proposed measure relating to residence requirements would require applicants to declare prior to obtaining citizenship their intention to reside, uh, something I already mentioned. But these are not the only measures in the bill that would reinforce the value of Canadian citizenship. A proposed amendment would require more citizenship applicants to meet the language and knowledge of Canada requirements. Nous voulons nous assurer. We want to make sure that potential citizens will be able to speak English or French when they apply for citizenship, which will allow them to become members in full standing of Canadian society. We also want to make sure that they will know enough about Canada. Therefore, if Bill C-24 is passed, applicants between the ages of 14 to 64 will have to meet language requirements and pass a knowledge test in either official language. As it now stands, people between the ages of 18 and 54 have to meet these requirements. Making this move because the language and knowledge requirements that we put in place so far have proven so successful and so popular. They have actually increased the interest and popularity of Canadian citizenship. Uh, I think all of those that come to this country understand how important it is to know the place you're living and to have some knowledge of the local languages, at least during your working years 
or your high school years. Mr. Speaker, could you give me an indication of how many minutes I have? Thank you. Deuxièmement, Monsieur le Président. Second, Mr. Speaker, a certain number of measures contained in Bill C-24 will give us more effective tools to fight citizenship fraud and, generally speaking, to make the system more, um, give it more integrity. Bill C-24 contains provisions uh, with regard to unscrupulous citizenship consultants. Under these provisions, the government will be empowered to designate a regulatory organization who will regulate uh, citizenship consultants. So non-authorized people who engage in this kind of activity will be deemed to have committed an offense. Similar, this reflects, mirrors in many ways, a move that we, uh, that my honorable colleague, now the Minister of Employment and Social Development, made with regard to immigration consultants. It has had an extremely positive, felicitous effect. Uh, and, 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 and we trust that the same uh, will happen for the smaller group uh, of citizenship consultants. Currently, the Citizenship Act bars applicants from citizenship when they have been charged with or convicted of an indictable offence in Canada or if they are serving a sentence in Canada. Provisions in Bill C-24 would expand criminal provisions to bar applicants for equivalent foreign convictions. Convictions, And no, uh, Mr. Speaker, we would not accept bogus foreign convictions. There would be uh, a provision by which uh, a repressive regime, an abusive regime, an autocratic regime which had falsely charged someone and convicted someone abroad uh, could still become a Canadian citizen, uh, citizen on the basis of an administrative and, if necessary, judicial review here in Canada. If passed, Bill C-24 would also streamline the process to revoke citizenship acquired by fraudulent means, leading to timelier revocation decisions while still ensuring legal recourse to individuals. As well, measures in the bill would ensure that international adoption safeguards are met. Finally, uh, Mr. Speaker, on the uh, integrity and fraud front, dual citizens and permanent residents convicted of terrorism, high treason, treason or certain spying offences, or who received a specified minimum sentence would be similarly affected. Uh, Mr. Speaker, let me emphasize, this is a matter that relates only to dual nationals or to those who are permanent residents seeking to become citizens. Uh, but there is, unfortunately, this side to our global reality today. Uh, according to CSIS, 130 Canadians are fighting with extremists somewhere in the world, uh, with te terrorist groups that have been listed by Canada uh, or uh, face listing by Canada, uh, 30 of them in Syria. Uh, and there is a real question for us, Mr. Speaker, and I think for most Canadians, about whether those Canadians, when they are dual nationals, have not literally breached their contract with Canada. Uh, and this uh, legislation, thanks to the Honourable Member for Calgary Northeast, would allow us to take action against them. <laughs> the Speaker, I almost passed over one of the most popular parts of this bill, uh, which are the measures that would make the citizenship program more efficient and ensure qualified applicants become citizens more quickly. These include a streamlined decision-making model, reducing the duplication of work from a three-step to a one-step process, giving the government authority to define what constitutes a complete citizenship application, uh, and ensuring a more uniform judicial review system for decisions under the Citizenship Act. Finally, Mr. Speaker, a troisième ensemble de disposition. A third group of provisions contained in the bill will pay homage to those who are serving Canada. And one of these provisions would expand the granting of citizenship to include children born or adopted abroad if one of the parents worked for the Canadian government or for the Canadian Armed Forces. Another initiative will expedite the granting of citizenship to permanent residents who are with the Canadian Armed Forces or to people seconded to them. Lastly, measures contained in the bill would allow the government to revoke Canadian citizenship to people with dual nationality who are fighting for a an armed force or an organized armed group abroad against Canada. For January 1st, 1947, when the first Citizenship Act came into force, uh, or before, in the case of Newfoundland, before 1949, who have not been so far entitled to the benefits, privileges, and responsibilities of Canadian citizenship. My colleague, the Minister of Employment and Social Development, did the mo took the most important steps to right this grievous wrong 
which had been left unaddressed for decades. This bill will ensure that we take the final steps to ensure the lost Canadians, those who were children of those who fought in the last World War, the Second World War, uh, those who were among um, the most committed to the defense and to the service of this country, enjoy all the benefits of Canadian citizenship, not just in the first generation, but in succeeding generations as governed by the provisions of this law. Uh, we're proud of this bill, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we're proud to be presenting it on a day when His Highness the Aga Khan said in this House that Canada has among the highest activity of voluntary institutions and not-for-profit organizations in the world. We think that is the proof of the value of Canadian citizenship. That is the proof of the dynamism of our society, and those are the grounds for strengthening Canadian citizenship for a new century, for a new millennium. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Sure. I'd like to say right off the bat that the NDP agrees that there should be um, changes made to the Citizenship Act. It's more than necessary. It hasn't been amended since 1977, and several aspects of the Citizenship Act uh, give rise to injustices, and the NDP has fought uh, for a long time to see that changed, and therefore um, I first was very pleased to see or to hear that the government was preparing amendments to the Citizenship Act. So yes, in this bill, I can say that there are several interesting aspects that the NDP is pleased to see in this bill, and that we would be pleased to support some of these changes that um, have long been necessary, and yet, um, as they always do, the these Conservatives are presenting us with a bill of some 50 pages long that amends many things and affects several aspects of citizenship at the same time. So uh, there are a great many details in this bill. Some, as I said, are very positive, but others are very worrisome. And they've already even uh, provoked concerns, legal and human rights concerns, uh, from civil society entities or other experts here in Canada. So, Mr. Speaker, there are people who are upset about several aspects of this bill, and I hope to explain how some components of this bill are worrisome and uh, maybe uh, even very problematic. So, first of all, let me talk to you about what I'm happy to see in this bill. The NDP certainly supports the fact that the bill will solve the situation of lost Canadians. And uh, they, these are people who have lost their citizenship. So give me a concrete example to, what, uh, to show what degree this is unfair and uh, why this was necessary to change. John is two years old. He's born in Quebec and has a Canadian father who is also the son of a Canadian father. So is he a Canadian? No. Because little John, here in Canada, lives with his father, but he has a temporary visa that will expire in the month of May. So that is a very precarious citizen, uh, situation to be in. So why is he not a citizen? Well, because his father, who was born the son of a Canadian, but he was born outside of the country, because his father served in the Canadian forces abroad. So rather than having the pride of having a grandfather who worked in the Canadian forces, John is rather penalized because of that service. And he wasn't able to give that citizenship to his child. So this little child doesn't have access to health insurance. He doesn't have access to public daycare, etc. And so this is a huge burden to the family and a situation that you'll understand is unfair. And John is not the only child in this situation. There are some 80 Canadians uh, who have lost their citizenship or, or never, simply never got it, and often these are tragic situations that affect many people around them at the same time. The NDP has fought a long time to ask the government to solve these, un these problems, so from critic to critic, member to member, through motions, uh, through press releases, 
the NDP has fought this battle, and today we're very happy to see that these people will see justice. These people should already be Canadian citizens, and they will be. The, another positive aspect is that of increasing or exp expediting the awarding of citizenship to permanent residents who serve as members of the Canadian Forces. And so this was in Bill C-425 in the last session and an element that the NDP already was in agreement with. One minor criticism here, it won't affect hundreds of people, only a handful, maybe five or ten. But uh, these are very, so these are very rare cases where permanent residents are accepted to serve within the Canadian Forces. Normally you already have to be a citizen to do so, so these are exceptional cases that uh, can be accepted into the forces as uh, with the standing of permanent resident. How status, how are we, and these people have met important needs and perhaps they're the only person available at that time who could meet those needs and we find it uh, desirable and fully acceptable to uh, see these people awarded their citizenship. Another positive aspect that uh, the NDP fought fiercely for was the implementation of measures uh, to uh, give a framework to immigration consultants and uh, make sure that there were not fraudulent consultants. The member for Trinity Spadina was a strong voice in asking the government to act on this issue. In a uh, press release in 2010, she was asking for a regulatory body to apply to uh, apply the rules and protect the public and today we're seeing that now and this is a positive aspect because yes once again many people are suffering because of bad immigration consultants even if most of these consultants are honest people that is what I wanted to say uh, 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 that was positive about uh, this bill C24 but let me say now a little bit about what requires consultation, in my opinion, with the public. Because there, these are concerning events and also because they have uh, really caused some debate within the Canadian population. First of all, the increase in the time of uh, mandatory residency in Canada in order to be awarded your citizenship. It's rare to, uh, I mean, people usually have spent some time in Canada but uh, uh, right now, we have to say that this specific measure makes clear some things that wasn't in the law before. It allows people to say how many days you have to be in the country in order to be eligible for citizenship. So that is positive. However, uh, we ha I, uh, and I will come back to this, the processing delays are terrible for dealing with citizenship files. If you're asking people to stay longer in Canada, it's even more important to ensure that their files be dealt with quickly and effectively as they should expect. The increase in costs for processing of files this is another issue that really should be debated. Why? Because we can understand that it's necessary to adjust prices. That's easy to understand because, but uh, the, uh, rather the, hasn't been a change for many years. So we can understand that the processing costs uh, go beyond what people are currently being asked to pay. But why go from $200 to $400? What uh, justifies that amount exactly? We haven't had any complete uh, information that tells us how they justified that specific amount. Why $50 more or less? Is it really something that would cover the costs? Or is this just an easy way to go and uh, get money from these people who are s asking for citizenship? And uh, Mr. Speaker, another thing is if we're asking people to pay more, uh, people usually expect to have better service. So once again, I come back to the processing times. Uh, the time it takes is unacceptable. The, the delays, the backlogs have doubled in, uh, under the Conservatives. So we can't ask people to pay more for a worse and worse service. So we'll have to make sure uh, that these two things go hand in hand, that more money results in better service. Another worrisome aspect that is not just subject for debate, but that has upset many com uh, communities in Canada is the age f uh, for the requirement of knowledge of both official languages. Now, on, on the contrary, people from 18 to 54 years of age had to pass a test in one of the two official languages. 
but now the age has been changed to 14 to 64 years. Now, once again, I understand the importance of mastering one of Canada's two official languages, but many people are concerned about this. First of all, because seniors, people between the ages of 18 and 54, might have a harder time mastering both official languages, studying for an exam, for example, or managing the stress of having to sit an exam. Many people in com the community live within their respective communities and can exist very well like that using perhaps different levels of language. Uh, but So there's a lot of stress related to this new test and also because the, the age has gone down. Why? Because a 14-year-old is now going to have to pass a test and that could define whether or not that person will become a citizen. So what happens to a child who doesn't pass the test for one reason or another, whereas the parents and siblings do? Will he be the only non-citizen in the family? Will that cause problems when the family travels, for example? So why impose a test that has such dire consequences for, to, on a 14-year-old? We know that young people who live in Canada have to go to school in one of the two official languages, and they will learn the language from day to day. So why put this terrible pressure on the 14-year-old child? That's a very questionable thing, Mr. Speaker. And as I said, we've had many exchanges with groups and individuals that question this particular aspect. Another component that uh, has raised the um, need for debate and also the concerns of many people is the elimination of the utilization of the time of the stay in Canada of the permanent resident. So this worries many foreign students and temporary foreign workers who are currently in Canada. They've been here maybe a few months, a few years even, and who had the intention of applying for citizenship in the future, and now they see they'll have to wait extra years, and that really changes their plans. And uh, I had heard, get many emails from my constituents, and I'd like to read a few for you because I think it's worthwhile. I received uh, emails from my constituents, but also from people across the country and across Quebec. Abdul Asad said, To Canada three years ago after being offered admission in world-leading universities. I have, won, I have won various prizes, grants, and awards during the last three years. After graduating a master in engineering, I chose entrepreneurship. I was promised a PR status within 12 months, which took 19 months. Yes, the delays are very long. I will have to wait two more years then to have citizenship. That person contributed studied here, worked here, create jobs here, and doesn't understand why we will deny him to take in consideration the time he has lived and contributed in Canada. Another example here is an email from Andreas Korinek. I will quote a few um, sentences of his email. The second issue I see with this bill is the new method of counting residence days. I personally came into Canada through a work permit and it took me two years to finally become permanent resident. I think the intention of the bill to make sure applicants are supporting Canadian society and sharing Canadian values are honorable. However, the metrics used to measure this are flared. I am contributing to Canada by working here and I'm paying taxes. I have Canadian spouse, Canadian friends. I joined a local sports team. I would like to be officially welcomed into Canadian society as a proud citizen. One last example, but, but I have a lot of them. Uh, Sultan Ali Ahmed, a McGill University student uh, who arrived, he arrived as a McGill University student in August 2007. He said, there should be recognition given to students graduating from Canadian universities who were initially on study permits, shared working after graduation, and then applied for their PRs. So as you can see, Mr. Speaker, many people are concerned 
They're worried about seeing their plans changed and they want us to review such a measure. I think that it deserves an honest debate at that level. To carry on, I would like, I think there are things that are not just uh, something for debate, but that are extremely worrisome on several levels. First of all, C24 increases the minister's discretionary power, including the minister being given under this bill the right to award or revoke citizenship in some circumstances. That's a tendency we see with the Conservatives. They take advantage of bills to give themselves more discretionary power. And this is something we do not favor in the NDP. Mr. Speaker, such discretionary power opens the door to uh, a political tool being used in our citizenship system. The minister said that he wasn't necessarily prepared to say who he would give citizenship to. So these kinds of things and decisions that could be taken behind closed doors that's managed by a political party, that's very worrisome. There are powerful tools. Citizenship has to remain a system that people have confidence in and that is neutral and transparent. I'm very worried about seeing the minister uh, have that kind of power. I don't like it to see going in that direction. Another uh, concern, um, under the provisions of this bill, the minister can revoke the citizenship if the person has dual citizenship, if there is any suspicion of fraud. Well, the clear word there, Mr. Chair, Speaker, rather, is the suspicion of the minister if he is convinced that uh, on the balance of prob probabilities this person may have gotten their citizenship through fraud. But the problem here is that the person here will no longer be able to uh, appear before a neutral tribunal to defend themselves against these accusations. That's very important. Someone who already has Canadian citizenship should have access to a fair trial before our justice system. That is worrisome. And in this case, it's, it's worrisome, but also in the case of someone who was accused of terrorism abroad and perhaps spends a few years in prison because of those uh, accusations might see themselves lose their citizenship. I mentioned it earlier in a question to the minister, but the major concern I have here in this case is that people can be accused of terrorism without perhaps having had a fair trial in a country where the legal system is not uh, uh, is not protected from political pressures. There are many cases here in Canada of people who have been imprisoned unfairly and uh, afterwards become heroes because it's clear that they have been imprisoned because of partisan and political motives. So I hear uh, some people talking about other cases behind me. So th anyway, those are very serious concerns. And I'll conclude by saying that this bill doesn't really uh, deal with the major problems we have with our citizenship system right now, which is the backlogs and the delays. This is terrible, Mr. Speaker. The backlogs have more than doubled under the Conservatives. They've waited all these years to really pretend that they are interested in this problem. This bill says it's going to solve the problems here this, and deal with the situation, but I don't agree. Nothing in this bill really proves beyond any shadow of doubt that there'll be significant change. So if we have only a few administrative uh, problems that will help the, to solve before the system works better, well, we should do so. There are permanent resident forms that are very complex and they take a long time to fill in. People will now have to say that they have the intention of residing in Canada. If we're, it's on the one hand, we're saying that we're making, we're streamlining the system, but on the other hand, we're making it more complex. So people are sick and tired of uh, being told they have to wait when they apply and they have the right to become citizens. They should have a quick and eff efficient answer. Mr. Speaker, for several reasons, the reasons that I have uh, already stated, I move seconded by the member for Toronto, Danforth, that the motion be amended by, by substituting um, 
after the word cur by the following, that this House refused to give second reading to Bill C-24, an act to amend the Citizenship Act and other act, because A, it provides no if sufficient solution for dealing with processing times, uh, they keep uh, going up. B, they gives uh, significant new powers to the minister that will provide this government to politicize the granting of Canadian citizenship. C, uh, gives the minister the power to revoke citizenship, which would prevent some Canadians from having access to a fair trial in Canada, which raises serious issues because Canadian law already includes mechanisms allowing for people to be punished who commit illegal acts, and D, includes a provision of a, a declaration of intent to reside in the country, which gives officials the power to speculate on the intentions of the applicant and to potentially turn them down for citizenship. So, Mr. Speaker, I thank you very much. And it is a great pleasure to say that the Liberals will be voting against this bill because, in our opinion, this is not good for Canada, it's bad for Canada. So we're very happy to vote against it. The main reason why we will vote against it is that, according to this bill, it will become more and more difficult to become a Canadian citizen. Put up barriers in terms of rising waiting times, and under this law, as I will describe in a few minutes in more detail, there are more and more barriers to becoming a citizen, and we do not think that this is good for Canada. As is often the case, though, with a large and complex bill, it's not that we dislike everything in this bill. In particular, we do like the uh, lost Canadian uh, legislation where citizenship to lost Canadians born before 1947 and to first generations born abroad will be uh, restored. So we were, are very much in favor of this. If the government were to produce the standalone legislation on this topic, we would certainly vote for it. But given that it is surrounded by other pollutants which we cannot support, we cannot support the bill in its entirety. But we would like it if we could support a separate bill on lost Canadians, and we would certainly be happy to support that. The second uh, item which we are in agreement with the government in spirit is that we do favor measures to enhance the loyalty of citizens to Canada and to combat the issue of citizens of convenience. We are not, however, convinced that the measures that the government has proposed in this area are terribly effective, and we uh, would have alternative measures we might favor. We do not think that the government's measures in this area will be effective, and we think that more harm is done by the barriers that they are raising for well-behaved people, not citizens of convenience, but hard-working, loyal potential Canadians who are barred from various artificial means set up by the government to become citizens of this country. And I think the way I would like to put it, to frame this in more general terms, is that immigration policy has to be a balance between welcome and vigilance. One has to be vigilant because there are always some what you might call bad apples. There will always be some people with marriages of convenience. There will be some people, or citizens of convenience, with phony marriages, people who want to play the system, people who are fraudulent. A very small number of people are in that category, and for that one requires vigilance. But for the vast numbers of people who come to Canada, whether as immigrants or as visitors or people as citizenship applicants, are good people. They are law-abiding people, and they should be welcomed. So yes, vigilance for the small number of bad apples, but also welcome for the vast majority who are good. And it is my contention, Mr. Speaker, that Canadian governments from John Diefenbaker to Paul Martin have put the main focus on welcome. 
The primary task was to welcome people to Canada, to welcome them to become landed immigrants and citizens and visitors, and yes, to focus somewhat on the bad apples, but the primary uh, emphasis, the primary priority was to welcome the large numbers of good people who want to come here. I think all of that has changed under the current government because there is very little welcome and it's almost all vigilance. Because what we hear about them talking day after day after day after day is people cheating the system, people with phony marriages, people who are citizens of convenience, as if that's the whole universe of people coming to this country. And we agree there are some of those, but by the fact, by the fact that the government spends all its time talking about the bad side and the vigilance and no time welcoming people, which is the broader, more important task, I think they've tilted the priorities away from the traditional Canadian way that we saw all the way from John Diefenbaker to Paul Martin. And let me just give you two examples taken from the time of John Diefenbaker. Because John Diefenbaker, you may recall, Mr. Speaker, was a progressive conservative prime minister. And so the colleagues on that side should approve of some of the things he did. And I certainly uh, do. And I will mention two. The first of these was there was the Hungarian Revolution in 1956-7. And under John Diefenbaker, there was a huge blip in immigration because his government allowed in some 38,000 refugees from Hungary. A huge number. I applaud it. And I am glad the minister is applauding too. And the country in those days was half the size it is today. So that would be the equivalent of some 80,000. I'm glad the minister is applauding because we were talking earlier about Sweden letting in 14,000 uh, refugees from uh, Syria permanently. He claimed they were temporary, but they weren't. Canada has a miserable number of 1,300, and they aren't even here yet, partly because he's not giving the authorization to the community groups who want to bring in refugees. So, yeah, okay, 38,000, he applauds, very good. He's struggling with 1,300 some 50 years later, but that's a different uh, topic, Mr. Speaker. I think the point I am making is that those 38,000 immigrants, refugees from Hungary, did they all pass difficult language tests? No, I doubt it. They came pretty quickly. Uh, did they have to wait years? Did they have to go through this barrier, that barrier, the next barrier in order to come to this country? No, they got under those ships pretty fast and 38,000 of him, them were here quickly. And they were welcomed warmly when they came to this country. So we welcomed them under Mr. Diefenbaker and that's good. Probably there were a few bad apples in that 38,000 just as there are in the Canadian population at large. And the government of today would focus all their time on the few bad apples of those 38,000 Hungarian refugees, whereas the government of the day and our party focuses on the great good that all of those people will do for this country and that they have done for this country and that their children have done for this country. And the second way in which I would praise uh, Mr. Diefenbaker is that there was a member of parliament who was convicted of uh, spying for, on Canada for the Soviet Union. He wasn't a conservative, he wasn't a liberal. I think he was a communist. But anyway, he was a member of parliament, and in the process of this happening, he, his citizenship was taken away. And Mr. Diefenbaker thought that was really bad. Even someone, a Canadian convicted of treason, he thought should not have his citizenship taken away. So he brought in a law that uh, did not allow governments to take away individual citizenship. And that was Mr. Diefenbaker, a progressive uh, conservative. So he was a liberal on these matters, a small L liberal, and he was focusing on the welcome uh, rather than on the uh, vigilance. And I think the same story goes through to Pierre Trudeau, clearly, uh, who, uh, you know, it, he, he invented the modern system of immigration and multiculturalism. And I would praise Brian Mulroney as well. I think he was open to immigration. He was welcoming. And he didn't spend all his time on talking about the bad apples. And the same for Jean Chrétien and the same for Paul Martin. Until we come to the current government, when all of a sudden the scales turn, and instead of 
welcoming people to this country, we spend all of our time talking about the small number of people who are not obeying the rules. And so I think that you want to, well, it works much better if you welcome newcomers with a smile, which we did starting with Diefenbaker up to Martin, instead of, as this government does, welcoming newcomers with a scowl. It's better to have sunny ways, as Wilfrid Laurier put it, and as our leader recently quoted, rather than angry ways. So we welcome people with a smile, from Diefenbaker to Trudeau to Mulroney to uh, Krejci and Martin, with a smile. We had sunny ways. We had a smile for the newcomers. And now, under the Conservatives, all they focus on is on the negative side, so it's not sunny ways, it's angry ways, and that is not good for our country. Why isn't it good for the country? Why, why is it good for Canada to act in such a hostile manner? Well, it's not a good idea because we are trying to build Canada, and if we want to build this country, we have to welcome those who are coming here to live with us. We are all immigrants. So we have to welcome people with a smile. You don't always have to be angry. And the other issue is economic. We are competing with other countries for immigrants with countries like Australia, the United States, uh, and the UK, and so on. These countries have uh, aging populations, so everybody needs immigrants. And if we welcome people with a smile, well, they will come to Canada rather than go to Australia or elsewhere. So there are good economic reasons to attract these people here. And the last point I would like to make on this is that it is a matter of the attitude of the public. If the public says nothing except that people are dishonest and that people get married for false reasons, if the government keeps on saying these bad things, people will begin to believe that immigrants are bad, that they are criminal. Sowing division because it's putting always the emphasis on the bad side of the immigrants, the things where they don't obey the rules, saying nothing about the much larger positive side. And so that gives the ideas to Canadian people who hear the government talk that these immigrants are not to be trusted, these visitors are not to be trusted, they might be really bad people. And so I think it sows division in this country. So my view is let sunny ways rather than angry ways prevail. Greet the people with a smile instead of a scowl and don't put up these new barriers all the time. So let me come now to what these five new barriers are, which we don't like. Or we could call them five new scowls provided by the Conservative Party to would-be <laughs> citizens. The first scowl is the fact they've doubled the processing times. He boasts that they're going to reduce those processing times at some point in the future. But over five long years, they've doubled those processing times from 15 months to 31 months. And the reason they give it in the document, it doesn't talk about it being a liberal system. They say explicitly they didn't put enough money into the system. And that is why the waiting times, the processing times have doubled. So that's the first scowl they sent to would-be citizens. Sorry, folks, instead of waiting 15 months like you did in 2007, you have to wait 31 months, and sometimes it's way, way longer. I have constituents who wait way longer than 31 months. So that's the first scowl, the first barrier. The second one is this hostile act about language. It was okay until now that people did the test age 18 to 15 for it. And now they're imposing a difficult language test also on the 14 to 18 and the 54 to 64. Why? Because they want to create another barrier, another scowl. 
Why was it not okay for 54 to 64 to speak okay English but not fantastic English and still make excellent contributions to this country and for their children to speak perfect English and their grandchildren? It's worked well before. They are loyal citizens. I know them very well, both citizens and landed immigrants. Third point. Um, here's another scowl. People come here as temporary foreign workers or as uh, students, international students. And it used to be that half the time they lived in this country as a student or as a temporary foreign worker uh, counted towards the time for citizenship. Now the government scowls at them again and grabs away that time and it counts for nothing. What's the point? You want to deter these people? You want to send them to Australia? You don't want them to come to Canada? There's no point except malice, except wanting to scowl at them instead of applying the sunny face of Liberals and perhaps even NDP. The fourth point is that uh, you now have to stay here four out of six years instead of three out of four. Another scowl. What makes you think someone will be more Canadian just because you make them stay an extra year? One more year is an extra time to wait. It doesn't necessarily make them Canadian. It doesn't necessarily deter citizens of convenience. It's just a, another nasty move by the Conservatives to make the barriers bigger against nice people who want to become citizens of our country. So those are four bad things, four scowls, four angry gestures. I will mention uh, one more, and this one I have some sympathy with, okay? I've been a little bit negative so far, perhaps. But the four I have mentioned are all scowls which I don't think add anything. The fifth, there's some sense in it. And this is the idea of increased physical presence. The idea that in, in four out of six years, the people should be here, here uh, uh, more than half the year, 183 days. I have some sympathy with that because I do have some concern with the phenomenon of citizens of convenience. I think it might be going a little bit far because let us say somebody comes in as a landed immigrant working, let's say, for a Royal Bank, you name a company. And that company, a Canadian company, then wants that person to work in UK or India or wherever. And that person, is, as a Canadian, could do it. As a landed immigrant, could not more than a certain time. So I think there's some problems with the detailed specification there. But I would suggest another measure which is more focused at the true bad behaviors and not hitting everybody. I mean, there will be many people coming to this country who are not citizens of convenience, but for some reason uh, their employer wants them to work overseas and they want to spend some time there. It doesn't mean they're citizens of convenience. So everybody gets tarred by that brush. But why not do have strict residence requirements for health care? I mean, that would really target people who were citizens of convenience. I understand there was a court case uh, heard by the BC Court of Appeal recently which upheld the government position on that. So to me that's a more targeted approach to direct against potential citizens of convenience and you'd hit them but you wouldn't hit everybody and a lot of the government measures are targeted at the bad people but they hit all the good people as well and therefore they are inefficient and unwelcoming and that is why I say they're not sunny ways, they're angry ways. And we should welcome people with a smile and not with a scowl. Et donc, en samet, Monsieur le Président, comment est-ce And so, Mr. Speaker, how much time do I have left? Two minutes. Thank you very much. I believe that uh, in light of what I've said so far is that the Liberals will not support this bill. The bill contains other problems. regarding the revocation of citizenship because this would apply to dual nationals. I believe that there are at least two dual citizens in this chamber, the leader of the opposition and my colleague, the former leader of the Liberal Party, the member for saint laurent cartier So the minister is giving himself the power to take away from these two colleagues their citizenship and to expulse them from Canada, I think that it's a bit too much power for a single individual. You have to understand that 
the definition of a dual citizen is a person born in Canada, which is the case of the two colleagues I've mentioned. It's not someone who is not born in Canada. So, in my view, the process proposed by the government does not allow for enough recourse before the courts and that there are too many arbitrary powers concentrated in the hands of one person. We're opposing this bill is that we want to welcome people to our country. We want to smile when they come in and not frown. We want to make it less of a burden and less of a waiting time to become a citizen, to become an economic immigrant, to become a visitor. The whole conservative system is drowning in increased waiting times. Typically, they've doubled. Drowning in red tape. And this bill is yet another example of adding more and more and more barriers against those honest people who, thank goodness for us, want to become the citizens of Canada. So I say, welcome them. Don't frown at them. Questions and comments. The Honourable Minister of Citizenship and Immigration. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's rather incredible to hear that question. Um, he talks of sunny ways, and then he goes on to make one of the most partisan speeches that I've heard in any debate in this place. Uh, I mean, th is this the new Liberal Party, Mr. Speaker? A party of ogres, a party of scaremongers, a party that talked down the Canadian economy, that talk about doom and gloom when we've had the top job creation record in the G7, when we are the only country in the G7 to have a AAA credit rating from all agencies with a positive outlook. They won't acknowledge these simple facts. And Mr. Speaker, it's terrifying to think of how newcomers to Canada would choose to understand this stream of consciousness presentation. Is, is the member opposite aware of some simple facts? Is he aware of the fact that this government has admitted to Canada, on average, 40,000, over 40,000 more permanent residents than his government ever did? Is he aware that we have, under our government, had 1.4 million new Canadians become new Canadian citizens? Is he aware, aware that his government slashed immigration to its lowest levels in the late, late 20th century in 83, 84, then again in 98, 99? Is he aware that it was his government that brought in these language requirements and made the residency requirement under the vast majority of their time in government in the 20th century five years, actually more than is proposed in this bill? Is he aware of those simple facts, Mr. Speaker, and is he aware of his utter hypocrisy? Uh, before, we, uh, before we go to the Honourable Member for Markham Unionville, uh, there were a couple of uh, um, suggestions in there of characterizations, if you will, of uh, other honourable members that when we enter into that kind of debate uh, is, is not helpful. And I just uh, ask honourable members to keep that in mind in the course of their remarks. Uh, the honourable member for uh, Markham Unionville. Well, I actually find it quite amusing, Mr. Speaker, that he should accuse me of partisan and you accuse him of being partisan. And the second part of his speech goes into this partisan rant. So let me just respond, instead of being partisan, with a few statistics coming from his own government statistics. If he could listen for just a second. Six, since 2007, I believe that his government was in power then, waiting times have increased by 200% for family reunification immigrants, by 65% for live-in caregivers, by 55% by, for provincial nominees, by up to 113% for federal skilled workers, by 150% for visitor visas, 107% for citizen applications. And he says he's doing a good job. Mr. Speaker, does he know, not know that time is of the essence when it comes to processing times for immigrants, for visitors, for citizens? And his government has absolutely bungled for eight long years. 